Hi everyone, this is Jim. Welcome to episode two of Opening Basics. Uh, today I'm going to look at uh, one of the most famous variations in all of chess, certainly the most famous one in the Sicilian, the uh, Nidorf variation of the Sicilian. Uh, before I get started, I want to uh, <laughs> give a word of caution. There's a lot of complications and uh, I certainly can't can cover it in the same kind of exhaustive depth that you could get uh, out of a, a book or a, a DVD series. And um, I did want to mention that uh, Grandmaster Daniel King, who has a, a, a YouTube chess channel uh, that goes by the name of Power Play Chess, uh, has released a series of DVDs about the Nidorf. Uh, I think he had one series originally, and then, then he's done some updates uh, with new ideas in the Nidorf. So if you really want to take your studying to the next level, um, that, that might be something to look at. I'll put a link in the description to one of his uh, YouTube videos. He did kind of a preview of one of his videos. His videos uh, cost money, of course. He's, he's making a living selling these DVDs. Well, I don't know if he makes a living doing it, but uh, anyway, he's, he's selling them. <laughs> and uh, <clears throat> um, So I'll put a link in the uh, description to one of his uh, previews that he had posted on his YouTube channel. It was, it was pretty interesting in its own, light, own right, and you can uh, take a look at it and see if you find it, uh, his style interesting and worthwhile. Um, so I'm just going to, to give you the introduction to the Nidorf here. So let's, let's put the moves on the board. Uh, we talked about the opening moves of the Sicilian before, e4, c5, knight f3. Um, there are other moves. Uh, white can play knight c3 or c3, and I will actually cover those in uh, future videos. Uh, I just want to remind you these aren't the only moves. You may be intending to play the Nidorf as black and you know white plays something else. Uh, you know, you've just got a deal. <laughs> You can't, you can't force your opponent to play an opening uh, unless he wants to play it too. Um, so d6 is the, the main way to get into the knight or if black plays uh, knight c6 here, it's usually a signal that he's going to play the, the Skevening, and I'm uh, not that, not that, the uh, Sveshnikov um, or the Kalashnikov. Um, but it can also transpose knight c6 followed by d6 and transpose into a uh, knight or as well. But d6 is the main way to get there. d4... C takes, knight takes. Now knight f6 attacking the pawn, knight c3 defending it. And you attack the pawn to prevent, uh, to force this knight out here and prevent uh, the move c4 setting up this bind. So this is a position that uh, black is striving for. And now a6 is the characteristic move of the Nidorf. So let's stop with this position on the board and talk about uh, uh, Miguel Nidorf. He's an Argentinian uh, chess player. And if you've been following my uh, series on the Zurich 1953 Candidates Tournament, you realize he was playing in that tournament. Um, but he was born in Poland. Uh, his, his original name was uh, uh, Moise Mendel uh, Nydorf, and um, he played for Poland uh, in the pre-war years, and he was playing in a chess Olympiad in Buenos Aires in 1939, in September of 1939, when World War II broke out. And so he didn't go back to Poland. He stayed in Argentina and made a life for himself there. He uh, wrote for a chess column for the newspaper in Buenos Aires and uh, just played for Argentina after that. Um, so, uh, just an interesting life. Um, it's, uh, so A6 is his idea and, um, well actually I can't say it's his idea, it's just an opening that he popularized. The, the idea behind A6 is um, Black wants to get in the move E5. But if he plays it right now, uh, white has this annoying move, bishop to b4, bishop b5 check. And uh, when, uh, when black box blocks the check, then this knight can move to the square f5, and um, the bishop is no longer defending that square. So this is uh, a good position for uh, white. And uh, so black is looking for an improvement. Um, overplaying this move right away. So he plays the move a6 to prepare it. So now e5 is, is sort of a threat. It's going to kick the knight down. Um, kick the knight around, I should say. The most popular move here, now this is uh, where white gets to choose. So black gets the first choice. He can choose which, which flavor of the Sicilian. He chose the knight or Now white gets to choose which line in the knight to play. Um, the most popular move these days, and uh, Overall, the most popular move is uh, bishop to e3. And this allows e5, so this allows a kind of classic knight of structure. So it's a good position to look at first. After uh, e5, the knight can actually go back to either of these squares. 
uh, but it's most common to go over here to b3. I think um, a lot of times white is going to castle queenside and he likes to have this knight over here um, as extra protection for the king and then knight may be able to reroute um, to other squares. Maybe it can go to uh, d2 and then to c4. There, there are different ideas for the knight over here. Um, so it's black's move. Black continues developing. Bishop e6. Black wants to keep an eye, eye out. Not an idea. He wants to keep an eye out on the square d5. And um, the idea is this move immediately discourages white from playing knight to um, knight d5. Planting a piece there. Because um, black can take this. And now uh, white is forced to take back with a pawn. And the bishop, uh, let's see, I guess bishop f5 is the best square for the bishop. Um, by planting a pawn on uh, d5, white's gained a few squares in, in the enemy camp, but he can't really make use of them. And uh, from black's point of view, what this pawn does is it actually shields uh, black's backward d pawn. So it's kind of a, an accomplishment for black to, uh, to get white to take back with a pawn here. And so, uh, so black is happy with this position. So white does not um, <clears throat> does not play that move knight d5. Instead, uh, continues with the uh, English attack setup with uh, f3. F3 supports the center. It also keeps the knight from coming to um, from coming to uh, g4 here and hitting the bishop, and prepares the move g4 later. The pawn pushes on the queen king side. So uh, right here is one of those points where uh, there, there's a couple ways to play it. Uh, black can develop his bishop or his knight, but you also have to consider the move um, d4, because uh, d5 rather, because this is a move you can get away with at this point. There's no tactical reason why you can't play it, and um, and it does get rid of your weakness. That the d6 pawn is a definite weakness, but in this case, uh, after the exchanges, say knight takes. Um, well, let's try knight takes, pawn takes, bishop takes. Um, black has the only pawn in the center, but white has quite a lead in development, and uh, he can increase the lead by playing c4, or kick the, the bishop around. And, uh, well, the chess engine is even recommending trading queens here and just playing for uh, the advantage in development and space. So, um, White, yeah, white just has uh, good pieces here, and it's a comfortable position. So, even when you can play this move um, d5 tactically, you have to look at the subsequent position and see if you're giving your opponent the uh, an easy game. It's more typical strategy for black to avoid that pawn push for a while and um, just continue developing his pieces. So, bishop e7, queen d2, um, castles, castles queenside and bringing the knight out. And as I mentioned before, the knight could have come out first and then the bishop. Uh, that can happen in either order, but you often get the same position. And now you're all set up. Both sides are uh, castled on opposite sides and they are preparing to attack. And uh, the game, the, the main line proceeds with uh, g4 and b5 just going right at it. Um, there is a threat here of uh, a pawn push hitting this knight, forcing him to a, a less favorable square. He doesn't want to go to uh, d5 in this particular case. Um, but it's uh, white also, it's white's turn to move here, and white typically pushes on with g5 immediately, um, just dislodging that pawn and maybe securing the square here for his knight. So uh, it's an interesting uh, and tactical game from this point with uh, attacks, both sides attacking. And uh, there are chances for both sides. This is actually about an evenly matched position in the engine's estimation. So fun way to play. Um, and that's the, the main line of the knight arf, but there are many other lines. And so let's go back to the starting position. Let's look at, um, so knight c3, a6, the first move of the knight arf. So um, that was bishop e3, leading to the, the, the main line as it's played today. Uh, there was a main line that was popular in the 70s, 60s, 70s, and 80s. Um, which is bishop g5. And uh, this is interesting because it kind of discourages the move uh, e5. And in fact, uh, black often, well, yeah, the most common move here is e6, and black almost always plays e6 there. Um, but you might want to look at why e5 is discouraged. It's strictly because this bishop can take the knight, and then this square is um, 
is available for White's knight to hop into, and it's a pretty good square. So if e5 is played immediately, kicking the knight, um, White doesn't have to move that uh, knight immediately. He can throw in this uh, exchange. And then he can even throw in the move knight to d5 because it hits the queen and it threatens a fork here. So you have to watch out for the knight hopping into c7 so the queen comes back. And now this knight can move. And um, the engine is even, yeah, and the, the opening book recommends a move uh, knight f5. Uh, this, this is a bit double-edged because the bishop can take the knight and uh, disorder the pawns a little bit. But, um, or g6 to kick the knight. G6 is okay, though. After G6, the knight would drop back to E3, and white's got this set up where he's supporting his knight. So uh, this is a kind of thing black prefers to avoid most of the time. He doesn't want white to have a, a strong piece in his camp like this. So uh, in this position, uh, after bishop G5, the E6 is the move. It's, it's uh, almost always played. And this uh, keeps control of the uh, keeps control of the D5 square and also supports the knight so that if uh, white takes then uh, black can just take back with the queen and not have to mess up his pawns. And um, this move e6 was so successful in this position that uh, if we go back to uh, the uh, the main line of the knightorf after a6 uh, bishop e3 uh, a lot of times black will just play e6 in this position too. It wasn't the original idea of the knightorf um, but it turns out to be quite playable because of the idea of keeping control of, uh, of these center squares um, uh, gives black a, a good game. So you can play either e6 or e5 in this position as black, uh, depending on your, your taste. Uh, Gary Kasparov uh, preferred the e6 move, but the traditional knight f move is e5. Okay, just a little bit about the main line. Back to bishop g5, that's what I was looking at. So e6 to avoid uh, knights coming in here. And um, and now white pushes on with f4, an interesting way to play, supporting the bishop and threatening e5. And also, in some lines, allowing the queen to come out to f3. I'll, I'll try and remember to show that line. <laughs> but uh, first, let's show the poison pawn line. Um, black has a wide range of choices, so he can play um, bishop, bishop e7, knight b d7, queen to c7. Um, but queen to b6 leads to the poison pawn variation. This queen comes out here, puts some pressure on the knight, and uh, attacks the b pawn. And if white just retreats the knight, um, this is an okay position. Uh, white uh, still has uh, some attacking ideas, but uh, black has got a decent position here too. So uh, the white player is looking for a little bit more than this. Um, this is a position with chances for both sides, so it's not nothing to be avoided in particular, but uh, but not uh, leading to much of an advantage for white either. Um, so the white player looking for an advantage plays queen d2 and um, basically daring black to take the pawn. <laughs> so black takes the pawn. Uh, otherwise, there's not much point to the queen b6 move. So black typically will take at this point, and that is the poison pawn. So the rook attacks the queen, queen drops back, and then f5, trying to bust up the center. And uh, so this is a position, uh, the chess engine rates it as about even, which means that white has a decent compensation for his pawn. And uh, a lot of games have been played from this position. Bobby Fischer used to play this way. Um, if black tries the move uh, e5 here, it's not so good. Um, he can, white, white can throw in the move, bishop takes f6, and then if pawn takes knight, bishop takes pawn. So, so black has to take back this way, and then the knight drops back here to b3. And uh, it looks like white is going to be able to drop a knight into d5. The game might continue, knight d7, knight d5. And uh, a pretty good position for white. White is still down a pawn, but um, uh, he's got uh, excellent control over the position with a strong knight here. And uh, black's queen is still out of play. So that move uh, e5 is not considered very... Uh, is not considered the best move here after f5. Um, typically, uh, uh, black will play a developing move like knight c6 and uh, allow allow white to exchange here and open up some lines against the king. So that's uh, that's where I'm going to leave you in this variation. I mean, this is uh, an exciting uh, position, and the variations go on and on. The chess engine once again rates this as about even. So uh, white has compensation for the pawn, but uh, 
black can defend, and uh, and uh, if he successfully defends without giving up material, uh, he can uh, look forward to an end game where he has a pawn up. <laughs> so uh, so interesting play for both sides. That's the poison pawn variation. Uh, if we back up after Bishop G5, um, there's a number of other lines. So let's take a look at. Um, um, how about queen c7? That's that's shows some of the ideas I wanted to show. There there are other moves too, of course. I just can't show them all. But this move queen f3 is very typical. It sets up uh, in addition to this threat of uh, e5. It also sets up a threat along this diagonal. So, uh, for example, if um, white plays b5 here. Um, Black can play. I mean, if Black plays b5 here, White can try this move uh, e5, attacking the knight and attacking the um, the rook. And now uh, you'll see the point of the queen c7 move is it supports the bishop b7. So uh, this gains a tempo for uh, gains a tempo for Black. Uh, the queen drops back, and now the the uh, it's time for the uh, the knight to move. Uh, knight d5 even can be played here, supported by. So this uh, particular case is uh, good for uh, black. But I just wanted to show that tactical idea because you'll see this if you play uh, some of these other moves, queen f3, uh, with black. And uh, if your queen isn't here on c7 to support bishop b7, you can get into a bit of trouble here sometimes with this pawn push e5 with a double attack along this diagonal. Uh, after you've opened it up with b5, which is a very typical attacking idea for black. So just something to be aware of. Okay, that's um, enough for the old main line, the bishop g5 line. I wanted to talk about one more attacking line. Um, so let's uh, get back to the startup of the Sicilian. Uh, a6, the startup of the Nidorf. So um, we looked at bishop e3 uh, going into an English attack. There's bishop g5, the old main line. There's also uh, bishop c4. This is known as the fischer sozin attack. And uh, it's a way to get an, an attacking line even though you're not uh, castling on opposite sides. Um, you're, you're immediately putting pressure on this diagonal and black plays e6 here to stop that. Um, so it's another way of discouraging black from playing e5. Um, one interesting thing about e5 is it really stops white from playing the move f4 in many cases, or it slows down the pawn side attack. So, so e5 is a desirable move from black's point of view uh, when he can get it in. But uh, and so a lot of a lot of white's play sometimes is ways of discouraging e5. Um, so bishop on c4 is a bit exposed. It's not under attack yet, but it's a bit loose, so it drops back to b3, um, b5. With the idea of pushing on, attacking this knight, and then grabbing, grabbing the pawn on e4, just just winning a pawn, and uh, black castles. And now, uh, if white, if black tries this, knight e2, taking the pawn. And uh, this is playable. This is a a, a pawn sack. Uh, white usually plays knight f4 here, so he's going for peace activity. Um, and uh, the position is about even once again. That it uh, means uh, white has compensation for the pawn. Um, this knight can reroute to c5, hitting the bishop. Um, maybe one of these pawns is going to be lost here pretty soon. I'm also wondering about if there's a tactic on e6. But uh, in any case, uh, a, a, a position that's about even. So it's odd that uh, uh, white is not worried about this threat. And black is not usually playing b4. Usually uh, the development continues with uh, bishop e7. And then, um, let's see, is this the position um, I wanted to show? Let's let's try it here. If if black plays bishop, uh, let's see, oh, it's it's white's turn. Mm, say uh, white continues with uh, bishop to g4. Bishop g5, just putting pressure on the knight. And um, the main move is castles here for black, and it's an okay position. But if you were to play this move, Bishop to b7. There's a tactic here that I wanted to show that um, whenever the uh, the bishop and the knight are ah, not that way. Whenever the bishop and the knight are focusing on e6, you have to watch out for this one. So white in this position can play bishop takes, pawn takes. Now knight takes, hitting the queen. 
a queen has to move. Say here, attacking the knight, and then the knight grabs a third pawn with check. King goes here, and uh, no, that's not a good square for the king. King goes here, and then the knight comes back here. So uh, this is a position that's favorable for white. He's uh, won three pawns for a piece, but um, he's exposed black's king, and uh, all his pieces can come flooding in. The knight is guarding some of those squares. The king, queen can't go there right away, but uh, a pretty dangerous position. So um, something to watch out for. The, the engine rates this as winning for white, so uh, with, with good play. A strong attacking player can can wipe you out. So, if uh, if you're playing the black side of the Sicilian, we have this kind of setup, and White has this setup where he's attacking on e6. Remember to keep that uh, pawn on e6 protected. So uh, it's okay to castle here, or um, uh, let's see, you can't develop a knight because uh, the knight's controlling a c6 square. So castling is probably the only move there. Just something to be aware of. Uh, particularly in these setups. And and if you have the white pieces, whenever you've got the, your bishop on this diagonal and the knight here, um, be sure to be looking for those tactics on e6. Sometimes you take first with the knight and then get a bishop here, um, but uh, usually it's bishop takes followed by knight takes is the, is the best way to play that. Okay, so that is the uh, fischer sozin attack. Let's see, do I want to go a few more steps here? Bishop e7. Let's see, a normal move here would be uh, queen f3, um, also with similar ideas, pushing this pawn and attacking the rick in the corner. So, and then queen c7 is a move here, also with the same idea of supporting bishop b7. So these, uh, uh, that's the point I wanted to make, is the same ideas occur in different uh, variations of the Sicilian. So, uh, so even though this is, may not be the particular line you're choosing to play, uh, you have to watch out for these ideas all over the place. Okay, so that's enough for the uh, fischer sozin It's a way to attack when you castle uh, kingside. Um, but there is one other way of playing, which is a more positional way of playing, uh, the Karpov line, which is... Um, okay, so let's back up. This is right here, a6 is the beginning of the knight orf. Bishop e2. And um, what this bishop move does... Well, first of all, it prepares castling. And secondly, it controls this um, g four square, so the knight can't uh, drop in there. And um, if black continues with e6, both e6 and e5 can be played there. So if he continues with e5, knight usually goes to b3 here, not wanting to, um, in this case, it doesn't want to come here and block the bishop, so it's it's coming back to b3, and it's definitely preferable to dropping it into f3. And then uh, the bishop can be developed to e6 here. Oh, no, it's, it's black's turn. Bishop e6, or bishop e7. That's bishop e7 is the most common move. And now the bishop can go to e3. That's the setup I wanted to show. So the knight uh, can't come in here and harass the uh, bishop. And um, bishop e6, normal developing, castles, castles. And uh, so there's less of a direct clash of pieces, but uh, still an interesting, uh, more strategical game is uh, in order from this position. Um, black is going to look for ways to push this pawn forward and eliminate the weakness, and uh, white is going to look for ways to restrain that and occupy the square with a piece, and that's how the battle will likely continue. Okay, so that uh, wraps it up for this video. Those are, uh, let's go back to the uh, starting position of the night orb. So uh, from here, a6. Yeah, so this is the uh, starting position of the knight orf variation, and, and we looked at um, the mainly the bishop moves, and these are the main moves, bishop e3, bishop g5, bishop c4, bishop d2, each with their own uh, flavor, but with a lot of uh, common ideas and tactics there. So I hope you guys found that interesting. Leave any comments you have in the section below, and I will be back soon with uh, more another variation on the Sicilian. See you then. Bye.